you would take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 5. OSAS. What's it stand for? Once saved, always saved. This is an extremely controversial doctrine. In fact, you have entire denominations that have split on this one issue. Is what I'm really going to say is that as a Christian, you can sin as much as you want and you are still secure in your salvation? Let me tell you this, if you're rejoicing in that, you might want to check where your heart is. But let me go ahead and spoil it. Yes. In fact, I would subscribe to the same... I would subscribe to the same thinking as D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, if you've ever heard of him. He was a pastor at Westminster Chapel for years and years and years. Chuck Swindoll, you're probably much more familiar with that name. But I would say that if you do not have believers who are tempted to abuse grace, then you are not preaching it correctly. Because grace is that free to us. It was very costly to God. It cost Him His Son. My sin, as flippantly as I think that it is, or just a simple byproduct of who I am, well, everybody does it, and my rationalizations all cost the Son of God His life. And we're not just talking about the multitude. There's a good biblical word, right? The multitude of my sins. I'm talking about just one. The wages of sin is? Death. We ever thought about that means for us, or is that always other people? Actually, the wages of sin, the wages of my sin, only by the grace of God has resulted in Jesus' death. That's serious. There's something noble about owning up to your wrong, taking responsibility, dealing with it to try to make it right, but I've only got one life which means I can only pay for one sin. And I have a feeling that if that were the case, that bill came due a long, long time ago. Probably when my mom said, don't touch that light socket. You guys wondered what was wrong with me. (laughs) Being from Kentucky is the good part. (laughs) What's that? No lights? We know that's not true. My example would be wrong. (laughs) Don't touch that candle, lantern. What do you want from me, Pastor Steve? Come on. (laughs) Who's preaching today? I'm just curious. I have the mic. But it's an amazing thing to think that the sins that I commit easily have a major price. And I think that it's in sincerity that a lot of People have sit here and considered this issue. Okay, you sin willfully and you're still going to heaven? Well, you can be on a, on a path of, of a lot of sin and you're still going to heaven? Really? You, you, that person who I went to youth group with and, and believed in Christ, now they, now they have these completely different beliefs that seem separated from the Bible. And you mean to tell me that they're still going? Yes, they are. And we're going to talk about why. If you ever have the opportunity to evangelize, and let me squash something real quick, there is no gift of evangelism. I haven't haven't heard this here yet, but I want to go ahead and say it so that you don't make the mistake and then I have to slap you, okay? I do it in love, kind of just from the wrist, but it's actually probably one of those needs this. Well, Sharing our faith. Yeah, we should do that. But you know what, preacher? I just don't have the gift of evangelism. And I take your hand and I say, there, there. That's okay. No one does. No one has the gift of evangelism. It's just what we're supposed to do. It's just what we've been called and commissioned. And if every single person knows the gospel, and you must know the gospel in order to be a saved person, then now you have a responsibility. We've actually been told in 2 Corinthians, you've been entrusted with a ministry of reconciliation. 
to beg the world to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Now why do I bring all this up in relation to once saved, always saved? Because in John 5, verse 24, is probably one of the most effective verses you could ever possibly use in evangelism. But don't miss what it says to you. Notice what happens here. Truly, truly. How many of you have the King James this morning? Verily, verily. And everybody else, 50 and under goes, what does that mean? It means truly, truly. Thank the Lord for modern translations, right? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Now, is this a good verse or what? Notice that Jesus gives two points and a result. When we're dealing with evangelizing, number one, people got to hear. If they don't hear, they can't believe. Somebody's got to say something. Now, if you're guilty of this, don't raise your hand. But have you ever gone home from work? Man, good grief, I work with a lot of pagans. That's wrong, because I'm sure that's what you think, right? But think about it. Man, they've got all these reasons why things need to be certain ways, and they're just as lost as can be. There's nothing about what God's Word has to say embedded at all in their thinking or, or anything. Good grief. And then... You take the dangerous step to pray. And you say, Lord, please send somebody to share them the gospel. Exactly. You didn't know it, but you just started praying for yourself. Right? And what happened in that case? Well, they got to hear. Who's going to tell them? Now, don't be so foolish as to think you work where you work because you like it. That's just a bonus if you do. You work where you work because it's a mission field. And God is sending out harvesters into this field. Maybe sowers into this field. To plant seeds, to water seeds, to watch God give growth. But they need to hear the Gospel. They need to hear about the good news, what Jesus Christ has done for them on the cross and paying for their sins, offering perfect righteousness, and that the dangers of not believing end up in judgment. In other words, our gospel presentation being in perfect alignment with the convicting work and ministry of the Holy Spirit through us. Everybody remember that from last week? So this is what we're talking about. Number one, they've got to hear. Number two, notice what it says. And believes believes the word is synonymous with faith what is belief what is faith it is not submission it is not surrender it is not promising not to do bad things anymore because now you're going to try really 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 hard to do good things if that were the requirement for salvation you have just become the savior We can do nothing to save ourselves. So someone had to do a perfect work that we could not do. And in doing so, we are told, believe on Him. Now you say, wait a second. It says, believe on Him who sent me. Isn't that talking about believing on God? Well, yes. But if we're familiar with the overview of everything in the Gospel of John, we find repeatedly that Jesus refers to I and the Father are one. That he's not doing anything that he hasn't had the Father tell him to do. That he's not going to say anything that the Father hasn't said. And the whole point he is trying to relate to them, and one of the reasons why people tried to stone him, was because he identified himself perfectly with God the Father. That was blasphemous in that time. And they wanted to kill him. But nobody stopped to ask if it was true. See, it's real easy to be emotional and retaliate. It's another thing to call a spiritual timeout and ask the question, have I been thinking wrong about this the entire time? So when it talks about believing Him who sent me, 
Everything that God has said about Jesus, do we believe that? Do we believe that He is the Savior, the promised Messiah? Do we believe He is the Son of God? Do we believe that? If you believe that, what do you have? Eternal life. So when you're sharing the Gospel with someone, you say, hey, let me tell you the Gospel. Here it is. Then you ask the question. Please ask the question. There's a lot of people that don't ask the question. There's a lot of people who the Holy Spirit uses to explain the Gospel and they never, forgive the phrase, pull the trigger. They never ask them, do you want to buy the car or what? They never say, do you believe this? Or a good way to phrase it is, is there anything that is keeping you from trusting Christ right now? Man, that kind of gives you a little bit more like, hmm, right? Are you saying we need to be underhanded and shifty and sultry in how we do things? No, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, is that the message that we are speaking has the power to bring people from death to life. Why would we not want to encourage them and exhort them to believe so that they would receive life? It's better than anything else they're ever going to encounter in this world. So why not call them to account for whether or not they believe it? Then you ask them the question. Now that you've believed in Jesus, what do you have? And the reason why you do that is because you make sure they understand it. If they give you something other than eternal life, they need to read the passage again. Someone came to D.L. Moody. How can I know for sure I'm saved? He said, John 5, 24, and he pulled out his Bible, and he said, read it. Guy read it out loud. And he goes, but I still don't know that I'm saved. He said, read it again. He read it again out loud and looked at it. But I still don't know that I'm saved. Moody said, read it again. Because if you've heard the good news, and you've believed in Christ, you have eternal life. It really is that simple. Now what is believing? What is faith? Faith is a confident conviction is what it is. I am convinced that this is true. That's the definition we get from Hebrews 11.1. It is a confident conviction that something is true. In fact, here's what's interesting. If you look where it says, believes him who sent me has, it's actually a present tense verb. Presently. You got it. It's yours. It's not that you're waiting in line to get it and somebody gave you a ticket and you're hoping they call your number. It's not that you're in a bank line waiting to get up to the front so that you can finally have it with all these ropes around. It's not that. It's the fact that at the moment that you believed, that's when it took place. In that moment. Well, I don't feel any different. That's okay. If your salvation were based on your feelings, you'd be in hell now. So aren't you thankful that it's not? But as we start to roll over this and think, good grief, Jesus did all the work and he pours out all of the benefit so that someone who deserves no benefit can have everything now. Everything now. Eternal life. Now just in case anybody was going to misconstrue what Jesus said, he went ahead and spoke again so he could clarify it. And look what he says here. And does not, does not, Come into what? No more judgment for your sin. Why? Because it had already been judged by the death of the Son. So notice, does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. In other words, the certain death that we were all on a path to receive has now been dismissed. You're free to go, death. You're no longer welcome here. Why? Because life, all capitals, has taken its place. In fact, when you look, notice that you have the has eternal life, and then it goes to and does not come into judgment, but has passed. Everybody see that? That has passed, that's the perfect tense of the verb. It is a completed action in the past with present results. It's already happened. It's already yours. It's completed action. So when you're evangelizing to somebody and you're talking to them and we want to evangelize a course according to God's word, we tell them the gospel, we ask them if they believe it and then we let them know, what is it that you now have? And the answer is eternal life. And you say, yes! And you will never come into judgment for your sins. You have already passed from eternal death 
into eternal life. Now, is that a good verse? Some of us don't seem sure. Promise you it is. Go ahead and take my word for it. It is, right? How about this? Turn with me over to John 10. The reason why we look to the Gospel of John for these things is because the Gospel of John has as its very thesis statement written to unsaved people in chapter 20. And we're not going to look at that right now, but if you want to look at it later, you can. John 10, we're going to start in verse 27. Jesus says some profound things here about eternal life. Watch what he says. 1027, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. Now stop, you might say, who in the world are these sheep? Are we talking about real sheep? <laughs> Is that what we're talking about? Well, back up to 26 so you can see. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Now stop. What are sheep? Believers. They're people who believe. Those who are not sheep are unbelievers. Seems pretty simple, right? Context always determines the meaning here. So notice, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now watch this, verse 28. And I give what? Notice that he gives it. Not earned. It's not deserved. It's not, man, you put in your time, here you go. It's not a payback situation. He gives it freely to them. Eternal or everlasting life. Now watch what he says here. And they will never... Everybody see that word never? Underline that word never. If you have a pen for any reason today, this would be what you want to use. Never. They will never perish. Now let's talk about this a little bit. And if I get it wrong, ask Pastor Steve where I did later. Okay? This word never in the Greek is what is known as an emphatic negation. I have all this in your notes, but just listen to me for a second because it makes you sound smart. This is known as an emphatic negation. And the idea here is that the word never is the word, is the words ume in Greek. And the idea is, is no, none. But what's interesting is, is everybody see the word perish? The word perish here is in the aorist tense. The aorist tense, here's what it means. It's the verbal idea of an entirety is the idea. But it's also in the subjunctive mood. You say, I'm already lost. Stick with me here, because I'm going to show you how it all ties together. The subjunctive mood is the mood of contingency. It's the idea of an of a unreality that's taken place, but it's a mood of potential action. So it's usually got a future orientation to it. It's something that could potentially take place. So, ume, meaning no, with the aorist subjunctive, means never! That's your Greek lesson for today. In fact, it is the strongest way that you can possibly put something in the Greek language. It is the strongest way you could use it. It is all caps, bold-faced, even if you want to italicize it, all kinds of exclamation, par exclamation points, and then one of these emojis afterwards. No! Never! Never! In fact, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, does anybody have that version here? Yeah, do you have that with you? And it says this, they will never perish, dot, 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 ever! Exclamation point. Never, ever. Never, ever, 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 never. Now, just from the way that it's grammatically put together in the original, and it's hard to argue with grammar because of Greece be, Greek being such a precise language, you have to walk away from this and go, maybe not. <laughs> At least. And why is that? Because unbelief wants to tell us otherwise. Because we want to focus on our sin rather than the truth of what's been said and done about our sin. So when you see this, or if you understand this, or you dig into this, you've at least got to go, I'm starting to get the point here. Notice after that, and no one, no one, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now this is Jesus talking, right? Now notice he's using the illustration of sheep. Everybody picture like maybe sheep in a field. And then here comes like the wolf. 
right? He's going to try to snatch a sheep. Nope. Can't get it. The wolf can't take you. Satan cannot remove you. And contrary to popular belief, because some people think, well, you can voluntarily walk away from your salvation, even you cannot remove yourself from the hand of Jesus Christ. Your willpower is not greater than His promise. And our sin, well, if you sin so much in a certain direction, He's going to let you go then. Your sin is not greater than His grace. It is impossible. So you, we are all, if you're a believer in Christ, you are held tightly in the grip of Jesus Christ. But guess what? It gets so much better. Look at the next one. My Father, verse 29. My Father, who has given them to me, is what? What's it say? Greater than all. The greatest ever. He's the goat. Everybody seen that goat? That's not blasphemous. G-O-A-T. Greatest of all time. In fact, we would say he is the goatee. He is the greatest of all time, everlasting, eternally. That works. <laughs> Write it down. You heard it here. But he's the greatest of all time. My father who is greater than all. Look what it says at the end of this. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Jesus has us. The Father has us. This is what is known as the double-fisted grip of God's grace. And no one can snatch you out of this impenetrable protection. You cannot be removed. And just so Jesus clears the fog for you, what's he say in verse 30? I and the Father are... Man, that's good. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life, whether you believe it or not, and you cannot lose your salvation. Now let me give you some differences here. It's one thing to be eternally secure. It's another thing to be assured, or to have assurance. Let me explain to you. Eternally secure would be the biblical side of it. God loves the world. God gave His Son. Whoever believes in Him will not perish, but has eternal life, right? That's the biblical side. That's what you have. And because God has declared it to be so, that doesn't go away. Once you're in, you're in. And you're in to stay. Period. What about those that are wayward and never live for Christ? Christ disciplines them. And one of the exercises of His wrath, according to Romans, is of a passive nature. In other words, when people are sinning willfully in a direction they want to go, and they're no longer being responsive to the Word or the Holy Spirit or to people calling people back from their sin to return to Christ and to confess that so that their relationship, their fellowship will be shored up once again, He lets them go of their own doing. The wrath of God on them is letting them live in their sin. In fact, you're probably familiar with it in Romans 1 when it says, He gave them up. He gave them up. He gave them up. And it's almost like He's stepping back each time from that situation. However, if you're a believer in Christ, eternal security can't go away. It's based on the promise of God. In order for somebody to be at one time secure and then not secure anymore, God would have to lie. So that's trouble. Now the difference is assurance. You may or may not at any given time feel assured of your salvation. You may at the moment of hearing go, good grief, this is great. I be, I be, this is great. I believe that eternal life is forever like it says that it is, and this is awesome. But then an hour later, you commit a heinous sin. And you sit here and you go, if I was really saved, would I sin like that? Do babies still spit up on themselves? Just because they're born doesn't mean they're perfect. Everybody see that? So all of a sudden, we get our eyes off of what Jesus has promised us and what He's done for us. And we start putting our eyes on ourselves and how we're doing, whether or not we're performing. We start making out that checklist, which is ultimately legalism is what it is, about whether or not we should be accepted by the Father based on our criteria that we're putting forward. That's how you lose assurance. That's how assurance gets robbed from you. And sadly, it's all based on usually emotions. We lose sight of what God has said. Or, or let's say it this way. How I'm doing has become the determinant factor of whether or not I'm accepted by the Father instead of pleading the blood of Christ 
and saying that I'm fully accepted because Christ is fully accepted. Somehow, because of my sin, I started thinking wrong about my relationship. Everybody see that? So that's a problem. Assurance situations are a problem. Let me give you an example of this. Take your Bible, turn to Psalm 51. I'm so fired up about today, I might go long. Forgive me. Not that that ever happens. Yes. Hey, man, if we're not excited about God's Word, what are we doing? He's made infinitely great promises to me. I'm about it. Probably what people would consider one of the worst sins ever was ever in history recorded is when David had Uriah killed in order to cover up the pregnancy because he was fornicating with his wife. Okay? The second greatest sin ever is the fornication with Bathsheba, right? But the first one ever is, well, let's kill him and get him out of the way so it doesn't look like anything wrong happened here. I'll marry her quickly. Nobody will know a difference. We'll just say he's kind of big for his age. I don't know. I mean, think about how simple person is going to try to reason to make this work. David's obviously not thinking clearly until Nathan the prophet comes to him and calls him to account for his sin. And it cuts him deeply. And Psalm 51 is a song that he wrote expressing his contrition regarding his sin, his, his humbling, his, his cry out and his confession to God. But I want to show you something interesting about it. Look at verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Because he knows his heart's dirty. He knows that he's defiled it by his sin. Notice what it says. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now remember what we talked about in the Old Testament times and in the Gospels. The Holy Spirit could be upon somebody, but never dwelt in them. That doesn't happen until Acts chapter 2 with the birth of the church. So in here, David understands, because he saw it happen to Saul. He saw from Saul's rebellion, when God removed the Holy Spirit from him, I bet that sent shivers through David. So notice, oh my gosh, I've committed a sin to such a degree where the Lord may not find me pleasing anymore and I've disqualified myself for the use of His purposes and He might take His presence a step back from me. That's scary to be thinking along those lines. But, but here's the thing, you can't deny the genuineness of David crying out. And look what he says right after that. Verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Notice he doesn't say, save me again. And he doesn't say, give me salvation because I didn't really have it the first time. He says, I've got salvation, but what's been robbed out of this is the joy. My sin robs the joy out of my salvation experience with the Lord. That's what we're talking about. So notice it's not save me again or try to really get me saved this time. Some people view baptism like that. Well, dunk me one more time. Maybe it'll take this time kind of thing. All right, we just want to make sure we got it all in there. You know, I mean, when we get like that about it, notice here it's no. What I'm losing out here is joy because fellowship has been distorted. That's what I need restored. So notice, restore to me the joy of my salvation and sustain me with a willing Spirit. Everybody see that David probably wavered a little bit in his assurance? But notice his salvation didn't go anywhere. Everybody see that? That's important to take note of. How about this? Everybody look at 1 Corinthians 5. This is always a fun one to talk about in church. We love the church of Corinth, right? Makes us feel pretty good. 1 Corinthians 5. Mitch, do we need to switch mics? Let me... Let me ask you this. Can you turn me down and that way it still records and I'll just yell? I seem to get a good response when I yell at people. It's good. You guys ready? <clears throat> okay. Just kidding. 1 Corinthians 5, look at verse 1. It's actually reported that there is immorality among you and immorality of a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles. That someone has his father's wife. This had to be real interesting for the first public reading when they got this letter from Paul. Probably nobody proofread it before they had a public reading. And can you imagine the guy who's reading it for everybody? Shock. He knows. Guess what? God knew way beforehand. A guy is sleeping with his stepmom. 
And the issue here, the action's bad. But if you were to read a little bit further, you find out that the leadership in the church was going, way to go, brother. Now that's weird. That's just how messed up Corinth was. And Paul says, no, this is horrible. This is sin. And you should view it as sin. And look what he says in verse 5. I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan. See, he lost his salvation. No. Read the verse. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. In other words, if he wants to conduct his body in this way, and he's not concerned about pursuing godliness and holiness, then turn him out into the world and let him do this to the hilt. Because Satan will kill him. His sin will lead to death. Believers who persist in wayward sin when they have smacked away the grace of God, God has no problem delivering them over to physical death. Because death is not the worst thing that could happen to us. And we become a detriment to the message of the gospel on the church. We're causing more harm than good for his purposes. He has no problem, guys. He's God. He can do that. Now here's the seriousness surrounding this. Watch this. Hand one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Here's the reason. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Still going to heaven? Absolutely. When you believe in Christ, what becomes redeemed in you is your spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to dwell there. So notice, still saved, still going to heaven, but living like the world and committing such acts that even lost people don't do because they have a moral barometer, speedometer, pedometer, I don't know, in them that helps them realize this is wrong. Church, lost people aren't even doing this and you guys are applauding it? Hand this guy over to his sin if that's what he wants to do. Cast him out of the body and let him live for himself. And if he persists in this, his life will be taken. But he'll still be saved. Persistent sin. You could probably have wavering assurance in this, but notice, Paul says, oh, he's still saved. But he's going to have consequences. How about this? This is a good one. Everybody turn over to Matthew 11. This is a real good one. Matthew 11. When you talk with people, And if you take Jesus out of the equation here and you say, hey, what person in the Bible would you most like to be like in your faith? Well, there's a lot of people that would immediately go to the Apostle Paul. It's probably because of the volume of stuff that that he's written. But after that, a lot of people usually choose John the Baptist. Oh, John the Baptist, man, he was fearless. He was radical. He lived so strange. He wore camel's hair and he ate locusts and honey. And man, he was just so organic. I don't know. But anyway... Definitely a gluten-free diet. I loved it, you know, all that stuff we're into today. But regardless, people gravitate towards these characters in the Bible because of their faithfulness to the Lord. But there comes a point because John was calling out Herod on his sin that Herod throws him in prison. Now watch this. Matthew 11, look at verse 3. Actually, let's back up. I apologize. Verse 1. When Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he departed from there. To teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John, while imprisoned, he's in prison, okay? Now, prison was not, we got cable and we're playing ping pong and I'm getting my GED. That's not prison back then, okay? It's not. It's not. <laughs> Think about it, guys. Um, while he was in prison, he heard the works of Christ and he sent word by his disciples. Now, notice, John is sending some of his followers over to Jesus. And look what he says. He said to him, are you the expected one? What's, what's another translation say? The expected one, what, what's it say? The coming one. Are you the one who is to come? Are you the Messiah? Notice what he says. Or shall we look for someone else? Now, every pause for a second. John the Baptist? You mean the guy who was the predicted forerunner of Christ in the book of Malachi? You mean the guy who in the womb was promised by the angel Gabriel that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit in Elizabeth's womb. Man, that had to be weird. Remember, she comes along and Mary says, oh, greetings, and John jumped because he was excited. You mean the one, the very one who sat there and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he even says at that moment, his disciples stopped following him and went over and started following Jesus. 
And now because of his present circumstances, he is sending a registered letter through his disciples to Jesus to ask, are you the Messiah? Let me ask you this, did John lose assurance? Yeah, he did. Is he still saved? Yeah, in fact, Jesus goes on to say, there's not anyone born of a woman that is greater than John the Baptist. Jesus knew his doubts, but look how Jesus reassures his doubts regardless of everything he'd been called to and all the revelation he'd been blessed with. Look, he says, Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. And watch this. The blind receive sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel, the good news preached to them, and blessed is he who does not take offense of me. In other words, he took little sections of Isaiah and completely unfolded them because those Isaiah passages speak of who the Messiah is, and John would have known this, and he said, this is happening now, this is happening now, this is happening now, this is happening now, just as Isaiah said it would happen of the Messiah. See, here's the interesting thing. Jesus doesn't come down and berate him because of his lack of assurance. But what he does do is point him to the scriptures and show him the evidence that, yes, I am exactly the coming one. That's exactly who I am. He's not there to destroy him because of his lack of assurance. He's there to give him more reasons to be assured when he loses sight. Sometimes emotion and circumstances can cost us our assurance. Now, there's another belief. It kind of couples in with this. It's kind of related to assurance. It actually causes a waiver of assurance. It's called the perseverance of the saints. Has anybody ever heard of the perseverance of the saints? I said this one time, uh, what I'm getting ready to say. Somebody almost fell out of their chair. Eternal security and perseverance of the saints are not the same thing. Somebody tells you that it is, they don't know their theology. Eternal security is the Bible saying, if you believed in Jesus, you are eternally secure. Perseverance of the saints says, well, if you're truly, genuinely authentically, really, really, really saved, then you will persevere in good works and faith to the very end of your life. To your dying day, you'll still be believing on your deathbed. Let me show you this quote. Interesting quote. I've got it in your notes, but I want to show it to you. Care to put it up there, Mitch? Interesting quote. This is John Piper. You probably know him from over in Minneapolis. He's pastored for years. He's now a professor. He's been a professor for a while, but now that's what he does. He says, I know people and would say this about myself, for whom the greatest threat to my perseverance and my ultimate salvation, ultimately being saved at the end of his life, is what he's talking about. And here's the reason why he says that. Because he believes that if you've believed in Christ, that was kind of the starting point, but if you don't have the good works to back it up at the end of your life, you prove yourself to not really be saved. So watch this. For whom the greatest threat of my perseverance and my ultimate salvation is the slowness of my sanctification, my growing in Christ. It's not a theoretical question like, did he rise from the dead or the problem of evil? I've got answers. But why I sin against my wife, the same at age 62 that I did at age 42, causes me sometimes to doubt my salvation or the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question. Who's he focusing on for the assurance of his salvation? Himself. Guys, understand this. If I look to myself for why or why I am not or are saved, I will depress myself. I am a depressing person. I know I've said this to you guys before. It's true. Because when I look at my sin, I know I'm disqualified. If that's all there was. But if I look to the Savior who pays perfectly for my sin and knows that I'm accepted because I'm pleading the blood of Jesus, I have the promise of God. You have eternal life. It's already yours. Then guess what? I'm the happiest person in the world. Because I've got something worth looking to that assures me. Not that I'm trying to find assurance in myself. We good? Everybody having fun on the ride? All right, let's keep going. Justification. What are we saying if we actually say that somebody could lose their salvation? What is justification? Justification is is that when you believe in Christ, you hear the gospel and you believe, God declares you legally righteous in His sight at that moment. You are put in a position of spotlessness and blamelessness in His sight. He puts on the Jesus glasses and sees you through them and you have no sin whatsoever in His presence. Now that's good stuff, isn't it? But if we were to say we could lose our salvation, we would say that God has to 
unjustify us. That all of a sudden he's going to take off the glasses. Oh, my bad. You're not the person I thought you were. You're gone. Is that really what we're saying? If we could lose our salvation? That God's legal declaration that I now have a righteous standing in him is wrong? I don't think God goes back on his word. How about this? A doctrine that is closely associated with that is called imputed righteousness. We've heard of this. The word imputed righteous, the idea of imputed, is the idea to be charged to somebody's account. That's a legal term as well. And what it's saying is, is that Jesus, when he died, became sin for me and made his righteousness available that it could all be put and charged to my account. 2 Corinthians, turn with me there, 2 Corinthians 5. Let's look at that. 2 Corinthians 5. I'm going to read it one time. I'm going to fill in the, the pronouns here for you a little bit so we'll understand a little bit better. Then we're going to talk about it. First Corinthians, or sorry, 2 Corinthians 5. Look at verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now stop for a second and let's do some things. Number one, let me read it and fill in the pronouns for you. The Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, cross out the italics, sin on our behalf. The sinless Son of God became sin. Okay, get that. He became sin. And look what it says after that. So that, here's the reason, we, those people who believe, might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. If you believe, you are then in Jesus. If you are in Jesus, you have the righteousness of God because Christ's perfect work paid for the sin problem and did away with it. And that righteousness that he has is now in your account. What are we saying if somebody loses their salvation? All of a sudden, somebody took all that out of your account? Anybody be upset if you deposited money in your account? Next thing you know, somebody just decided to take it out because they didn't like the way you cut them off? Would that be a problem? You guys don't seem very concerned whether or not you lose things out of your account. I'll tell you what. Give me withdrawal slips from your bank with your, with your number on it. And just sign it over to me. I'll take it out, create a big pile right here, and we'll see how you fare throughout the week. Right? A peanut butter at Walmart becomes a lot harder to buy when you ain't got anything there to do it. So notice this. We take it out of somebody's account? Bad. How about this one? We know this one. In fact, let's just throw it up there, Mitch. John 14, 16. You know this one. I will ask of the Father. He will give you another helper. That he may be with you forever. Are you sure? Can you imagine the Holy Spirit? You believed the Holy Spirit? Oh, yeah. Comes in, starts setting up shop, and you... Yeah, this is good right here. Oh, uh, I decided I didn't want you here. So I've had eviction papers drawn up. Holy Spirit, you got to go. Does any of us think that our sin could possibly evict the Holy Spirit? Everybody see how crazy that is? God himself, the Holy Spirit, takes up residence within us. And then we would like to conclude because our sin is so bad. Or we decide that we want to step away or, or whatever. We fall, we backslidden. There's a good Kentucky word. Backslide. You know, we've fallen away. Jim, what? Yes. Man, you need to write Hallmark cards. Yes. When you want to draw up eviction papers on the Holy Spirit, he'll start drawing up conviction papers on you. Man. That better be your Facebook status or I'm going to be upset. Now here's a question. Just how secure are you? That's a good question to ask. Here's what I'm going to ask everybody to do. Put your Bibles down. In your handout, you have this. In your handout, you have this. If you didn't get a handout and you would like one of these, let me know, and we'll make Zach give it to you. Funny? Let me go. Okay. Buddy, are you being good in church? Okay. Please be quiet. Jesus knows. Anybody else? Okay. Zach, you're not doing a good job here. If anybody needs to doubt their salvation. Uh, what else? <laughs> Just, kidding. Just kidding. Here we go. Can you pass it down to Carl, please? Just pass it down. 
Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? For real, I want everybody to have one. If you're here, you need one. Yes? Pass it down if you don't mind. Thank you. Everybody. Everybody's got one. Uh, between you and the Lord, you're going to miss out. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. I want to take you through some verses. You don't have to worry about your Bible. I'm going to put them up on the screen for you, but everybody now needs your pen. Now, I want you to take the manila-covered little envelope here, pull it out, and you're going to write your name on it. You don't want to benefit from this? Come on. Yes. Yeah. You're going to put it, you're going to fill out a check to cash and drop it in here. Be good. Everybody got it? Everybody got your name on here? Yes? Mitch, throw up the first verse. What we got? There we go. Colossians 1, 25, 26. Uh, is that right? Yes. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations. So there's something that's true that hasn't been previously revealed, but Paul is making it known now, but is now manifested to his saints. And what is that? Next verse. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. How secure are you? Well, if you take your little paper here that says Jesus. When you came to faith in Christ, Jesus is in you. So you open up your little manala envelope here. And you say, Jesus is in me because Colossians 1.27 tells me. And the reason why I have the hope of glory is his presence and indwelling in my life. Guess what? Christ is in me. Now that's a beautiful thought, isn't it? I'm never alone. When I became a believer, I got more than I bargained for. Christ is in me. Now, not only that, how about the next one, Mitch? For you have died. And your life, when you became a believer, you died to sin and became alive to God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Christ in you. You have Christ in you. Now, a good segue verse that we look at, 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22. This is a good one because it includes it. It kind of branches it all together for us. You got it, Mitch? Oh, come on, man. I did too. 2 <laughs> Corinthians. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, he who establishes us with you, where? Where's our location? In Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us. And gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. The Holy Spirit in you is a pledge. So you pull out this paper that says Spirit. Guess where He goes? Oh man, yes. He indwells you and He seals you. How about the next one, Mitch? Romans 6.11 Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Your new location. Now, you want to take your little envelope here with your name on it and go ahead and lick it because I couldn't get uh, the pull away sticky stuff. I tried. Germ, saliva. I get it. It's weird. But anybody seen that Seinfeld episode? <laughs> George's fiance? Never mind. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Some of you know what I'm talking about later. <laughs> no, you, Jim was too busy studying his Bible to watch that. That's good. The Lord knows your heart. All right. So notice this next part. Look what it says. Even so, consider. Don't go back. Go back. Even so, it's hard to find good help these days. Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Open up your envelope here and put you inside the Jesus envelope. That's where you go. Not only is the Holy Spirit in you, not only is Christ in you, you are in Christ. In fact, do this. Set it aside for a second and grab your Bible. Let's see this. Ephesians 1. I want to take you there quickly just to show you something. If you were to do nothing but just mark the location of the believer in Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. I'm going to read it quickly. I'm going to emphasize properly. Everybody got it? Everybody got your eyes on? You ready? Here we go. Oh, sorry. You ready? Okay, thank you, Connie. All right. 
Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Watch. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love. He predestined us to the adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed to us in the Beloved. In Him we have the redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him. Oh, stick with me, guys. We're too close to the end for everybody to be slacking off now. In Him, with a view to the administration, that word's also dispensation, suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His win, uh, sorry, will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. Is being in Christ a good place to be? In fact, He gives us everything by being in Christ, in Jesus Christ. But that's not the end of it. Go to the next one. Go back to Colossians 3.3. 3. Go back to Colossians 3.3. 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ. Not only Christ in you, but you in Christ. And go ahead and pull your little fun thing and clean up or Sheila will have my head. Okay? And seal your Jesus envelope. But not only are you in Jesus, but you are hidden with Him in the Father. Drop it down in there. And it fits just snugly as it should. Pull that zip tie and seal this deal. Because if you have heard the word and you have believed, you have eternal life. You will not come into judgment, but you have passed from death into life. And let me give you this in Paul's words, just in case there's any other questions about this. Romans 8, look at the screen. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in, 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 in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. You may not feel assured at times, but your security was never taken from you because it is secured upon the perfect work of Christ, not you. We are a blessed, sealed, locked up, double-fisted grip of God's grace, completely enabled to be sprung from His love. Period. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the goodness and the grace that You show us and the promises of Christ. And if this has been an issue that we've struggled with in our hearts and our minds, I pray that the Scriptures would convict us otherwise. Your mercy is complete. And You desire for us to know You and know You and know You and to look to Jesus for our assurance, not to ourselves or our performance. Our experience means nothing if we don't have Your Word to explain it. So we pray, Father, Settle this issue in our hearts if we are unsettled. Renew to us the joy of our salvation if we have broken fellowship with You by our sin. Father, help us to rejoice greatly that Jesus has paid it all. And thank You, Jesus, for doing that. Holy Spirit, minister this to our hearts and illuminate our understanding. I ask it in Christ's name. Amen.
Just got one thing I wanted to share with you real quick is uh, next Sunday, Pastor Paul Scharf and his wife Lynette will be here, the brand new representatives of Friends of Israel Ministry, and we'll be having a potluck afterwards. If you would, please, on your way out, sign up at the sign-up sheet uh, there on the Welcome Center. We'd very much appreciate it. Let's bow our heads, please. Father, thank you that we are an accepted people because of all that Jesus has done. Thank you that his salvation is full and free. Thank you that the requirement he asks of us is to believe, to be confidently convinced that he is the Son of God. If we've had wavering assurance, if we've had doubts, we see many well-respected people in the Bible did the same. But your loving words drew them to a greater assurance of their faith. And it's because it rests on the finished work of the cross and not our performance or lack thereof. Thank you, God, for being so merciful to us. We love you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Okay. Okay. Six o'clock. First Thursday of every month, six o'clock, men's ministry meeting. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Good. You're dismissed. Sure.